everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Bulletproof Dental Practice Podcast. It's Peter and I today. Peter and I. Every time I say that, I'm always like, Peter and I. Wait, maybe you were right when I corrected you. And you Peter know what? I'm sorry Tell for me. correcting you. I'm sorry for correcting it you. It sounds good, though. It sounds Five. one word. It does Peter sound. And I. But I think it's supposed to be like whenever you grammatically say something, you're supposed to like see see how it sounds. But like, I can say Peter and me, Peter and me, Peter and I. I the point I'm trying to make is not the, the grammatic reference to myself. It's that it flows into one word, Peter and I, or Peter and me. Anyway, it's the, the two of us. We can make it if we try. But um, what we're talking about today is something pretty cool, something abnormal, I think, in most dental practices. And we don't want this to come across as a humble brag because this is years and years and years of working. And uh, we, we skinned our knees, made the wrong decisions, hired the wrong people, got rid of the right, put the right people on the bus. And and uh, we've both found ourselves in a very interesting space. And I want to talk about how the, the genesis of this, by the way, there's two genesis behind this. So the topic today is going to be how to create a $2 million per year hygiene practice, <clears throat> meaning how do you get to $2 million a year in hygiene alone? And uh, funny thing was I was talking to you, Pete, and this goes back maybe two, three years ago. Mm-hmm. And I remember saying something like, oh yeah, this is what we're doing. Like, wait, 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 hold on a second. Dude, do you realize that you your practice does $2 million a year in hygiene? I was like, well, yeah. I'm like, but Pete, you told me, you know, I saw your numbers. He's like, oh shit. Yeah. Oh, I guess I do too. You know, remember that conversation yeah, we had? Yeah. It was like, he had such FOMO and he's like, man, I can't believe that. I'm like, well, wait, 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 Pete, let me pull up your numbers again. Cause we look at each other's numbers and sure enough, he was there too. So, um, well, look, I got to give some more context. And I wrote this in the foreword of the book that, so Sharissa and Brittany are two of our respective hygienists who are, you know, one of our ex, one of our excellent hygienists that are in our entire practice ecosystem. And they did the Bulletproof Summit, uh, which now was launched. And it was such success when they were speaking their hygiene component that we, they launched the Bulletproof Hygiene, which is kind of, they're, they're, they're writing a book, which is going to be awesome right now. And they're going to be doing- Yeah, it's actually own- going to publish right now, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, and they actually just finished doing a digital course. So stay tuned on that. Cause we'll let the, uh, the, you know, the bulletproof audience know about how to get the hygiene, you know, the hygiene game and the practice leveled up. And that's kind of the thesis of what we're talking about today. But I, but it was interesting. I was writing the foreword to the book and I can remember, I can remember sitting in the audience. So that this was Craig, this was probably circa 2007 maybe in an audience or, or maybe listening to someone talk. And the, and I know his name, his name was, um, his last name was Kozarski. I forget his first name now. For it wasn't TV Black's lecture. You old, no. you old mofo. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, Mike Kozarski and he's out in West. I think he was in Washington, Oregon. Okay. Anyway, well, what was it about? He was a Hornbrook guy. And uh, I remember hearing him and he said, he's like, man, my practice does a, it. And this was when literally I was struggling as a clinician to get my practice to a million dollar practice a year, right? So maybe it was probably, yeah, 2006, let's say. Anyway, I can remember him saying that. And it just it just hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, wait a second, you're telling me that your practice does a million dollars a year without you involved? Meaning, yes, I know you're involved in the hygiene, but the, but the clinical production of hygiene mean, means your practice is a million dollars a year. And it, I, I, was, I just couldn't believe that, Craig. I want to I want to put a small pin in what you're saying. Right Wait, now. hold on. Why? No, I got I got to say something because I don't okay. want. I, I, there's someone listening right now. He's about to turn this off. They're about to turn this off because no, I'm, I'm, I'm. Well, let me tell you what I think because I, I spent. They you might know, now because you just you just interrupted my story. No, 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 no. no. I, you know, you, you're Mike Kozarski's going to come right back. By okay. the way, and I, I think right. that's a guy from Ghostbusters. By the way, Mike Kozarski. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> yeah, it's it's. A, I'm going to find this out, but I just want to say something real quick. Because right now, Pete, you're not on social media, you know, the 26 hours a day that I am, but there's a massive dialogue going on right now about the prima donna hygienist and that, you know, all they care about is blah, 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 blah. And let's do it with the hygienist and we don't need them anymore anyway. And these people don't even realize that there's a massive dialogue going on there. So I'm just hearing, I can hear the listener right now, like, oh, two million, a million dollar product. You know, I, I hate my hygienist. I hate them. They're the, they're the bane of my existence, the thorn of my side in my side. And I just want to say, put a pin in that because we're going to teach you 
um, or we're going to at least explain through this podcast some of the reasons why we think that happens as well. So go back to, because I, I, I think it's important to touch on that, uh, Pete. Yeah, okay. Go back but, to and, and that's fair, go, right? But I just remember in the context of thinking about that, I was like, how is that even possible? Like, and 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 it, for the first time, it kind of blew my mind. I was like, wait a second, that is, that is you know, the hygiene business is a business inside of the practice, which is a business, right? And so um, it was just cool and it was eye-opening. And so when you and I had that conversation finally about like, when, and I was mind blown again, like, dude, you have a $2 million practice, a hygiene practice. And you said, well, well, you do too. It was extra mind blowing because I can, I remembered sitting there being blown away by the one. And so I think this, the purpose of this, Craig, this podcast is to unpack what we feel the components have been in the journey, the, the Knicks, the, the climbing uphill. Um, and it's not to bow and say, bow up and say, cause I'm sure there are people who have bigger than, than $2 million oh, hygiene practices, right? It's not to bow up and say, we've figured it all out, but it is quite an accomplishment, um, to get to that point. And I think there's, uh, things that we can teach and promote for the gals coming on to do more of their shtick and, and, um, and teaching our audience kind of like some things, you know, and if you can just take some couple of little takeaways, it really changes the game. Absolutely. And um, one more background piece. So you were in that audience in 2007. And I guess the people that are regular listeners of the podcast know that I wrote my descriptive vision in 2008. And that was when I had four or five employees and, you know, nothing really going on as far as professional development. And I wrote in my descriptive vision, what is that, 12 years ago? Uh, we're excited. This is the actual excerpt. And, and by the way, I made up names because I didn't have anybody named these by these names. So I just made it all up. I said, but we're all excited to review our Friday schedule. A dental team from Texas will be with us for the day to learn how we operate and the secrets of our successful practice. The hygienist from the Texas practice is excited to partner with our hygiene manager, Sheila, for the whole day because she read the book Sheila wrote on hygiene protocol. And I go on to say that I'm especially proud of because I know she took it upon herself to write and complete the projects on their own. So the funny thing is I wrote that and then I parked it and forgot about it. And funny enough, Brittany came to me, you know, with Sharice and said, I want to write a book. I'm like, oh, like Sheila. And she's like, what do you mean? I'm like, did you remember my vision I shared with you? And she's like, I don't remember the exact details of it. You want to send it to me again? I'm like, in my vision, I had a hygienist named Sheila that decided to take it upon herself to write a book. And I just think it's really cool because um, like, like everything that we talk about, we'll give you the three or four steps or the five steps to do, but it all starts with vision. So Pete and the audience in 2007 dreamt for a second when he was listening to Mike Kozarski, he said, that's going to be me one day. I'm going to do that. And I had that vision as well. So the first thing you need to do is if you have the vision that your hygienists suck and that they are here to rob your practice and just look out for themselves, you've got to change that narrative. Or if it's a change. loss leader, right? Right. Or if you think that it's like, oh, I just do it to like, it's just such a loss leader. Hygiene sucks. Woe is me. And they drive me crazy. And, yeah. You know, they want, I'm in California and they want, you know, $50 an hour and the profi fee is only 50 bucks. And how do I do all this? Just think of something bigger. Like the mm -hmm. first step has to be to, in order to, to have the psychology to solve the problem. You can't use the psychology that created the problem. Mm -hmm. So the first step before you listen to the five steps or whatever, the, the seven easy steps that Pete's about to go into, you no, got to, I know it's just a, it's an internal joke, but you got to solve the psychology. You got to say, okay, what could the hygiene department look like? And even I was at fact, I'm a faculty for some really high level companies made nameless. Um, and I was internal at this faculty it limes with it in mine. No, 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 no. We can't say that. But uh, anyway, um, not that one, but oh. line, uh, rhymes with something else. But anyway, so I'm sitting there and these are the educators. So there's like 20, 30 doctors in a room. And these are the people that are responsible to educate dentists on how to do more of this product. And instantly the dialogue went in like, well, hygienist, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, hygiene. I'm like, oh shit, these are the doctors talking about mm -hmm. that. So we're the educators. So I actually said, you know, listen, hygienists actually want to do the right thing. They got into the profession because they want to help people. They build the relationships. They want to do more. They want to understand more than just scraping teeth. And I think we, as the leaders and dentists that are, are, supervise them, because in you know, every state they can't practice autonomously, we, autonomously, we limit them. So I think it's important just to start you with know, that. You know, you and I have said, and I think some dentists get a little bit <clears throat> butthurt when we say this, but I think that the hygienists are the heroes of dentistry, the profession. For sure. Right? And For I think sure that they are, they are in, in a place to, you know, it's not it's not the hygiene department, so to speak, and the restorative department. It's my, you know, when you can, 
when you are beating on all cylinders with your hygienist and you are, you know, they, not only do they help you diagnose, help you and say they did diagnosis. Okay. Yeah. God. Um, but they will help you enroll more. You help them enroll more. It's confirmation in the appointment of, uh, you know, when, when you all are in concurrence, it goes back to your philosophy, Craig, when you talk about the book, if Disney ran your hospital, like they can see that genuine authenticity of your relationship with them. And people tend to sign up more in that environment. And they have right? a sense of purpose too. Like they're, they're doing something that's a bigger purpose. How many hygienists do you know of that would come to you and say, they, the last guy I worked for would never let me probe. Or, you know, when mm-hmm. I want to do SRP, just said, no, just do, do, you know, even those radiographic calculus, just do a bloody profi, or we don't do that here. You know, and it's, or, it's or start shutting too. them down. So the hygienist comes into the room and says, Hey, Dr. Bold, I'm a little concerned about this. And you say, Hey, Diane, there's nothing there. Like, mm-hmm. you know, do your job basically. Right. And like, you just shut that person down forever versus like, Hey, Diane, I see your concern. Mm-hmm. You know, I told, thanks for pointing that to my attention that that redness does look a little concerning. You know, let's take a photo of it and monitor, it. or I'm not as concerned, but I really appreciate you bringing it up. Wow. You know, Mrs. Jones, you're really lucky Diane's your hygienist because she th- sees things that I don't even see, you know? So thank you. She's, she's sitting here for an hour. I got a five minute exam or 10 minute exam. So that's you know, it, and honestly, Greg, we, we overestimate as dentists, the, yes, we have great relationships with our patient, but I, but I promise you in our brains, we think that that's a bigger relationship. If, if the, doctor leaves okay patient may leave if the hygienist leaves and they have a relationship there is a good chance they're following because they have a bona fide relationship like almost like a you know because they're seeing them obviously on regular intervals they've they've probably become more friendly with them they've probably been more therapeutic in terms of you know women go yeah well they 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 talk talk about same things they spent non they spent non-stressful time with them too so when they see us it might be for two hours but it's like a crown or veneers or something like that they see them just for like almost like their hairdresser like seeing in a non they're just getting a cleaning it's a relaxing thing for many people so i gotta tell you so one thing that i think took our our practices you know let's go back to the 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 two million dollar mark for a second and, it, and I'm going to use that as the as the the flag banner, right? Of like why why we're talking about this. But the one thing that I saw that changed both of our practices, because I went back and did kind of the you know the intel on when your practice started to change from hygiene component to, is when you guys. Um, so I was actually at the founding. I was a founding member. Craig, I don't even know if you knew this of AI. I knew that. Okay, I was in the room when it was. Wait, say it again. I stepped on you and you said it. I want I want you to say the word. What founding member of AI? Yeah, AOS, yeah, I'm AOS, sorry, yes. Yeah. I, I the, talked the right American said- Academy of Oral Systemic Health at the time. And it was um my friend Chris called me. It was in it was in Wisconsin and we went up in, and anyway, I didn't end up staying in the organization because I was just overwhelmed growing at the time. Um, but anyway, it's it's a great organization and my hygienists are, are deeply involved in it. And when it was a paradigm shift, when we started looking at the body as in terms of just like doing regular profies and bloody profies and, you know, which everyone's kind of, we started looking at things from an oral systemic connection, a holistic connection of the hygienist being the one who is the first line of, of healthcare in the dental industry um, and changing the game. Not only did they become more engaged because they had more purpose to what they were doing daily, as opposed to just bloody profies and people being like, I hate being here. It gave them purpose and they got to be able to talk with physicians and they got to say, Hey, I see infection here. Hey, you know, they became really like a ranking member of the diagnostic team, if you will. Right. It wasn't just the dentist who came in and said, well, what I see here is, and so it was just a paradigm shift and and literally it changed changed their meaning. It it changed changed it to a calling. It wasn't a job. It was a calling. Like we don't, we could all do that you know, in anything that we do, like, you know, everything you do has a deeper meaning if you're willing to look into it and create that meaning for yourself. And, you know, and then just digging deep and and I think inspired a lot of them to go, you know, we always talk about the growth of us as humans. And I think it inspired a lot of them to, to get outside their box and grow way beyond what they learned in hygiene school, right? From a microbiological, I had a lot of hygienists going into micro, micro, my microscopy and looking at things under microscope and sharing that. Um, things into something like PerioProtect, which, you know, we can talk more about that later. And, and, and the hygiene gals, will talk about this more. There's obviously some tools and tricks that they use, um, not, only from a, not only from a sequence of how they do the appointment, but also kind of some of the therapeutics and some of the techniques that are, that are involved. And that's how you get to be very productive with your time. But the patient wins at the same time. They're getting really healthy. Um, 
Totally. Yeah. It, it's just that deeper sense of meaning. And, and like, it, I mean, it's like anything else. It's that famous Antoine saint Superi quote that I was talking about. Like, if you want to build a ship, you don't tell people to go out and gather sticks and wood. You teach them to long for the immensity of the mm-hmm. sea. So even a bricklayer that, you know, uh, I'm sorry for the bricklayers out there, the sons and daughters of bricklayers, but there is a, there's something different to a person who's like, I'm a bricklayer or bricklayer or no, I build foundations that last for generations. Mm -hmm. And in healthcare, Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so there's, I just went to Chick-fil-A. Here's my iced tea. Mm -hmm. So Chick-fil-A has a very interesting thing. I love talking about them these days. So same $10 per hour, $8 per hour fry maker. Right. Mm -hmm. But the culture when you go there like to own a chick-fil-a you have to work there so you and i if you and i scrapped up two million dollars or whatever millions of dollars we can't go out and buy a chick-fil-a pete we'd have to go in as fry maker and become fry maker so there's and then there's also a a religious uh spiritual guidelines Mm -hmm. to their to their company as well when you when i leave they say my pleasure the point i'm trying to make is they're selling uh, you know on sorry chick-fil-a you're selling unhealthy food that's really really quite bad for you you know but those people have a sense of meaning and what our hygienists are doing. So let's look at the order of significance and, and uh, what we're doing to serve humanity, serving fried chicken, cleaning people's teeth and helping them live longer, more productive, healthy lives, massive. But yet people at Chick-fil-A feel really satisfied. They feel like they're creating meaning. Uh, you know, they, they feel a sense of satisfaction. People are lining up to go there and patronize them. Team culture, they're good feeling team part culture. of the team but they're selling French fries and chicken. Mm-hmm. It's not good. It's good if you don't go to Chick-fil-A. It is good if you come here. It is bad if you don't come here to this office or our mm-hmm. offices. So it's really- Well, they're the best of the bad actors maybe. In well, the, I, but uh, the point space. I'm trying to make is that <laughs> if you can get significant selling fried chicken, then imagine how easy it is to create significance, meaning, and connection for our hygienists. And it's up to us to do that. You know what? I hope hygienists are actually listening to this. And I hope they just send it to their dentist. If they feel like they're in an environment, you know, uh, not, you know, that that that's not allowing them to reach their potential. It's just give your give your boss, your your doctor, give her or him a little bit of grace. We don't, we don't get taught leadership, teen development in dental school. In fact, our dental training, so I'm speaking to the hygienist now, is actually the antithesis of team. Mm-hmm. It's all class rank, who does a better wax up, trying to get mm-hmm. ahead, who's ahead of, it, it's not a good culture. So it's no wonder we get a four years out of that and we come in and we're like, you know, feeling pretty scarce. So give your doc a little bit of grace, but send the podcast to him and, and let's have that conversation or have them, you know, start listening to our stuff. Cause And it's amazing, Craig, as dentists, we get to, you know, if we had to practice the same way we did when we got out of school, right? Which is what the way a lot of hygienists, you know, they get out of hygiene school and they kind of just do the same thing. If we as dentists kind of had to keep doing that, Without being able to go to the spoil, the, oh, the spoils, yeah. the spear, and the coice, and the and the horn, you know, all I these never places. even thought. I never even thought about that, Pete. It's it's I, and yeah. so it would be so. God, could you imagine having to practice yeah, that? Way? So linear, so upsetting, so so much burnout. So burnout, right? And so yeah, that's I mean, what I'm saying. But our hygienists mm-hmm. get fired up because they know, like Sharisa, for instance. I'm just going to speak about her. I know for a fact that she has saved people's lives. I know for a fact. I've seen it yeah. in inflammation. I've seen it in, we have, we have kind of anecdotal evidence, um, you know, yeah. regrowing bone and all sorts of things, just oh, really awesome. cool impact on people, right. And truly changing people's well being or lives. And so, you know, I that's agree. not taught in hygiene school. No, that's well, not, it's it. not taught for us in dental school. <laughs> well, that's true. Well, that's true. I guess, you know, I mean, we now? don't get, we don't, it, it, knows, none right? of this is taught. So, but I think the understanding that dentists, uh, pursue CE and advanced training and evolve the career is a little bit more readily understood than hygienist because a hygienist could be limited by the psychology and skill set and understanding of her boss. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you and I have the ability to learn new stuff. Even if you're, you know, no matter where you are in your practice, if you're an associate, you could go to your owner doc and say, Hey, I want to learn Lanap or I want to learn, uh, you know, implants. He's like, good, great. Let's go to Coise. Let's make more money. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's oftentimes conversations where your owner or doctor could say to you as a hygienist, like, no, we don't do that here. Mm-hmm. Now we're, we do 30 minute pro fees. That's how it's always been. And blah, blah, yep. blah, blah, blah. Turn them in, get them in, get them out, get them in, get so them out. We have, we have a specific responsibility, Pete, um, in with Bulletproof because we have Bulletproof hygiene, which is great. Get all, mm-hmm. get the hygienists all fired up, but then we have Bulletproof dental and we have to work together 
because we have to shift the psychology of the dentist as well to say, right. train your hygienist, find the right one, get the vision of what it could be and let them rip. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I had is I sent Brittany to Charissa. Mm -hmm. So Brittany at the time was probably doing like, I don't know, 250, 200 grand a year, a lot of money. Don't get mm -hmm. me wrong. Maybe it's great. That's a great, idea. great money. Yeah. 20, mm -hmm. 20 G's a month or something like that. And uh, I'm like, I wanted to send up, I wanted to go to ADS and she went up with Ashley and they spent the day with Charissa and, um, and it was just this understanding because Teresa did so many different adjunctive techniques. And mm -hmm. I said, Brittany, not only do you have to learn all this stuff, but then you have to come back to this office and convince all the doctors why this is great. So it was really hard for her. Well, so she learned it. Not only did she learn it though, but she also picked up on some verbiage and yeah. some things, the way to present it. Cause you know, it's so, that's so much, that's almost as important as being able to know how to, you know, know what to say. Um, I just, it just dawned on me, Craig, actually, before you joined the podcast, <clears throat> I love saying that. Um, well, there's two episodes before that. But... No. Well, whatever. It, what You're there's right. Two. It's so much better now. Charissa oh, was, oh my God. Let's rewind that and say that again. No, she kidding. was, Charisse, I interviewed Charissa. So if you want to hear. Um, oh, that's right. I listened to that one. Was yeah. So if you, if you all are hearing this and you want to see like, oh, who's, who are these mythical creatures you speak of? Um, you know, and maybe this was circa 2017 when she and I spoke or 16, but anyway, go way back in and just look at, I think it's the, the yeah, we'll put a link to it. We'll it's put a link the, to it. In the show I, I named it the 500 K because at the time she was doing, she did like 587 for the year. And, and yeah. again, we're just using this as scorecard or metric and getting people healthy, but she un kind of unpacks some of the methodology that was done to get to that point. Um, and that was, you know, so anyway, really cool. But going back to uh, sharing, we, we have had the benefit you and I have not only sharing things that from a practice level, holistically from a macro, but also being able to put our practice directors in touch with each other and share best practices, which then we've been able to communicate to our mastermind and some to our summits, but also in our hygiene departments, like sharing best practices there, yep. you know, and I encourage and, and people. By but, the way, so we're talking, you're talking tactical and, and you're talking because like, that's what, what I do. No, 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 no. I, and I, I, it's very valuable to hear this. And it's also valuable to hear what's possible. So Brittany, you know, the, the story of the Roger Bannister four minute mile, no one could run a four minute mile. And then an English physician, mm -hmm. Roger Bannister, people thought before the four minute mile that it was physically impossible for the human body to move that quickly. Mm -hmm. So there was four minute, one second, four minute, three seconds, whatever. Roger Bannister does it, crushes it like three minute, 59 seconds. Wait, and, he was a physician? Yeah, he was an English physician. Really? Who just happened to run on the side? I don't know. Listen, no, Pete. I feel like and this even, is fake news, but okay. But you never let the truth get in the way of a good story. So Google it later. Not okay. on my dime, bro. Okay. So anyway, he broke so, the four-minute sorry, mile. Sorry. He broke the four-minute mile, and then very soon afterwards, everybody broke the four-minute mile. His record mm -hmm. was instantly shattered. The point I'm trying to make with that is having a hygienist see what's possible is huge. Like the bulletproof hygiene attendees were on fire. I remember mm -hmm. walking in that room, and it was Teresa and Brittany talking at our last mastermind summit in. Uh, well, they, that was a test kitchen, right? We invited them to come and just see like, because we, we wanted to have, it wasn't just, Hey, the doctors come, Hey, bring your hygienist. And so it was kind of a test thing to see if it would work. Oh and I remember God, going in that room and, be, and everybody was on fire. The fire. notes, everybody's scribbling down. They didn't want to leave. Possible. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we called all the hygienists back into the room after like, hey, how was it? It was like, woo, they're clapping. It was amazing. So it's it's two things. It's the tactical and the belief of what's possible mm -hmm. because everybody knows it's this, every as dentists, we're scientists, we tend to over-focus on the skills, but it's also the psychology. So the words, the way you do it, the way you see it. And and it's unique with a wet, with wet fingered hygienists like Brittany and Teresa, that they can actually, you can see how they do it and how they deal with over, you know, patient objections and stuff like that. Cause you know, listen, it's not easy. Some patients are very difficult, but when they understand why and, and, and they feel the passion and, and um, care that the hygienists have, they just tend to say yes more often. It's really, really cool. I agree. By the way, one, one cool story about the practice here. <clears throat> this is right before COVID hit. Um, I told Brittany, I, I read this book called Who. And it was a great, it's a great book. And it's about hiring. And one of the things is that you should always be networking. Mm -hmm. So I told Brittany, do me a favor, go in the community because she knows she's like an educator in the community. I said, do me a favor, go asking around um, uh, people, you know, in the community saying, who is it some, who is someone I should meet? Not saying someone who is not, who's looking for a job, but who do you think are like a couple of people I should like take out for lunch and meet in the community? 
and with the spirit of like, hey, the air's pretty thin up here. Who, and I like to know. Who is she asking this to? to use like the terms. hygiene educators, the director of the hygiene program, okay. those type okay. of people. Like who, who's, who's someone that's really at the top of their game that's a person I should know? Mm-hmm. So from that conversation came this girl, Shay. And Brittany likes to joke around. She'll be blushing when she hears this. But she's like, I had a hygiene crush on Shay. Like I wanted to get her here. I wanted to recruit her to this office. And she actually recruited Shay to the office. And then COVID hit. And then Shay went on a recruiting um, hunt to bring her friend Jennifer in here. Mm -hmm. So Jennifer was pulled in from a very successful practice down the road and was recruited by Shay, something I could have never done. Mm -hmm. Imagine me saying, hey, you're going to love it here. You know, quit your job. I would never do that. I'm the first. I never want to unseat a happy relationship. So but but uh, but one of your people could. Because they, they can speak from an authentic standpoint of saying, hey, here's the challenge. Here's what's good about STG. Here's what's hard about STG. Mm-hmm. I think you'll be great. And sure enough, Jenny came over and, um, you know, from Shay and that all happened just from Brittany having this conversation. So when you have- So it was motiv- transformed, you know, the power of your practice was transformed by one question. You're saying like, who do I, and, who should I meet? And the power of the practice was transformed by creating passion and a sense of purpose. So we're talking, I, I, and I'm always aware when we talk numbers, there's, there's people who say, oh, those are big numbers. And people have a lot of baggage around money too, Pete. You know what I mean? Like you I, broke that's psychology. Why hesit- that's why I hesitate when I say, well, it was this number. And I, I clarify it with, well, it's just the scorecard. Like has, how else are we going to say I know, I heard successful? you say that. You because, said it's the scorecard I, for taking care of people. It really is, right? Yeah. It's, and I, I truly feel that. And that's not a lot of bullshit. I really feel that way. Um, well, of course that you, you feel that way because you wouldn't be successful if you felt other way, another but I, way. But I like to say that because I think sometimes, I think as dentists, we, we get, you know, almost shamed. In, Why you, you just talk about production and collection all the time. What the hell is this? You know, and you almost get shamed into the, into that. Uh, what am I trying to say? That verb. Yeah. That, yeah. Shamed into pro- profit of our patient. And right. it's and never that's not what that it is. It's that's never not that exactly way. what it is. So I, I like to put a, put a disclaimer on that when I say that, just because, it's amazing, amazing, way above the standard of care, care. <laughs> you yeah, know? like Brittany, Brittany with me, by the way, like, you know, the dentist, I'm like the, the shoemaker's wife here. So like I had missed like a year of cleanings or something like that. And I had a in my mouth and Brittany like did an exam, something. She like looked at my chart. She's like, that's your seat. Like we need to spend like an hour and a half. Like I just need to go through. No one's taking care of you. I need to go through. It's like you know, this is not a money thing. She's not compensated for what she's doing. I mean, she's like, I'm mm. coming in a day off. We need to do this right. I don't want an, I want an FMX. I want a proper perio chart, not mm-hmm. spot probing. And I want to chart your, you know, recession areas. I want to take some photos and like just went to town on me because mm-hmm. she really, well, you know, she wanted to do it right. And that's how we are with everybody. And it's it, the funny thing is you can actually have it all. People make decisions in their life. Well, I don't really want, want to make it about the money. Okay, I get it. But do you want to make it about taking the absolute very best care of each patient? Well, yeah, I do want to do that. Well, guess then you're going to make a lot of money because you're rewarded in life for the value you bring to life. Life supports what brings more life to, you know, life supports Mm -hmm. life. Things happen, you know, so you can actually have it all. But I think a lot of us screw ourselves up psychologically. And I see a lot of this stuff where people have a psychological barrier to the money. They actually don't, they, they, they don't allow themselves to be successful. Speaking of on a tangent, you said them about the when is their book coming out? It's actually in publishing right now. You and I just wrote the forward, so it's an edit. Um, and we're going to have them on, right? To yeah, to start kind of talking because I feel like they would be better as opposed to me talking about like some of the tactics. You know, you always bust yeah, them if you're going sure. tactical. But there are some like there are like three things that are that I want to say right now. But it's obviously longer than what we do. But I'd like to I'd like to go through it with them. So maybe we'll create a series around, uh, you know part and parcel yeah, of, well, the, of their books, right? Kind of going through the right. methodology. Well, they're going to do their own bit. podcast. So maybe the first three episodes will be with us, you okay. know, as the Brady Bunch squares on Zoom well, calling. That's a good idea. F- and then let them rip. Right, right. Yeah, but but um, that I, I think if there's one thing that could transform your practice in the most powerful way, it's empowering your team, obviously, on a holistic sense, but on the, on the one department, the department that you can leverage the highest is your hygiene department. I cannot tell you how hard our hygienists work to do things that they are not even remotely compensated for. In right. fact, they're disincentivized. Enrolling they, restorative. Right. Enrolling but they're, Invisalign. Enrolling they're, dis, they're disincentivized. I'm getting, they're texts, their time. I'm getting texts right now on the phone, mm-hmm. right now, 
Dr. C, can you come see um, this Invisalign console at 3.30, Shay's room, requested to see you. Like yeah. that is going to slow Shay down. Right. But, but she knows they, it's in the best they, interest of the patient. Because right, because she sees the wear. And by the way, so many people are talking about Invisalign with crowding. Does the crowding bother you? Don't ask patients if the crowding bothers yeah. them. If a, if a patient's 23 years old and they've lost two or three millimeters of their incisal edges because of their deep bite, do you really think it's important to tell, ask them if it's bothering them? <laughs> and everything we do, and I'm going to go off on a small little rant, just a small one. Everything we talk about in dentistry at least the, the needs-based stuff, gets worse really quickly. So if you have a DO and you don't treat it, it turns into a bigger thing within three to six months. But occlusion is one of the things that I tell patients, don't think of this as a three to six month issue. Okay, so don't leave here saying like, oh my God, suppose I told me I'm wearing my teeth. No, we're not saying that. You're 24. You had these teeth for 12 years already. But in 12 years, you see how flat they are and how short they are? In 12 years, you've done like 30 years of damage. It's so like what a I wheel want, alignment, right? If you would have kept driving, your car would have been yeah. bankrupt on the side of the road. But by the way, you are doing a disservice to the patient if you by do not, not have this conversation. <laughs> Let them decide if they want to wait. But you owe it to them. You owe it to each patient to tell them what's happening. You say, look at how, and, I, and you know, the occlusal glare, the Itera, you flip it over and you see how square and flat those little incisors are. I'm like, if you were eight, 70 years old, we don't have a problem. We don't need to talk about anything, but you're 24. And our hygienists know that. So I don't have a chance to talk about this stuff. They're doing it. You and know, what, I would love for you to, I want you to think about this as doing a podcast because you have an exceptional ability to have sweaty back conversations or not even sweaty back, but like maybe just like Craig's icebreakers of how you get into talking about the dentistry without saying, Hey, does this bother you? No, it doesn't bother me. And then moving on, like you're saying, you go in a different way. It's not aggressive, but like, I've heard you yeah. do it and you have a very masterful way. So I think it'd be cool to like, like maybe giving people on a podcast, your verbiage, you know, yeah, that's what I'm doing for this line right now. It's yeah, what I'm doing I, for I know you are. And, and that's why I'm saying it, but I'm saying yeah. like how to broach topics with people or the verbiage that you use. Um, you know, and I, I really like doing it too. Cause you, as you know, I'm into kind of body language and yeah. NLP and that was one of my, you know, that's one of my things is kind of converting back. You know, I like, I like the consultation. I like enrolling. I like looking at how people yeah. are feeling, but maybe that would be a great podcast. Oh, because I think so one. many people struggle with, I don't even want to say anything. Cause what if they say no, it's because of the time frame. Because right. everything that the dentist is telling the patient is an immediate need. Mm -hmm. So when they tell them about their crowded teeth, it's not an immediate need, but the patient doesn't know that. Mm -hmm. So the, the, they are automatically say like, why are you trying to sell me this? And we go in and we, we take the problem and we don't tell them the consequence of what's going to happen by correct. They say, hey, get, you got crowded teeth. You should get Invisalign. Like that, that's the worst thing you can yeah. do. It's like we go hunting around looking for anything just on fire. Like, look, I see a, I see a leaky amalgam. Yeah, right. let's do that. Let's do so that. it's it's a different conversation. It's like, hey, you got beautiful teeth. How you know you're 25 years old? And it's by the way, it's got to be. I meet people that have really severe malocclusion, and they're 80, and their teeth have mammalons on them. So mm -hmm. it is it is not about occlusion. It is not about crowding. It's about your no 80 year old have mammalons. I dude, I had a lady. I don't want to talk about it. It's too clinical. I don't want to talk about it. I'm going to go clinical for a second. Okay. Just lady open bite touching in two spots in the posterior. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I told her, Hey, I, I know you're like 80. Does, uh, do you have any difficulty chewing? Why do you ask? And I don't want to bring it up because the minute you tell people they have a problem with their bite, like, how do you freaking bite a sandwich? Your teeth don't even come near each other. <laughs> She's 80. She's been on this planet a long time. I'm like, I was just curious. Any, any jaw issues? No, nothing. I'm like, cool. She's like, why'd you ask? I'm like, no, I'm just curious. I like to ask these questions. Cause I don't want to tell her like what's like, going how on. How the hell you're chewing on two point contacts. <laughs> but you know what? That's the point. The, you know, occlusion is not pathologic. It's what you do. It's the activities 100%. around occlusion that are pathologic. <clears throat> All right. Where, where are we so, at? What are we doing here? Time, times, times. How are you feeling? Uh, with what? The times? Just, just today. How are you feeling today? Today is 11, um, November 4th, 2020. How are you feeling? Oh, I know, but that by the time this airs, we could already be in like, you know, okay. we could have been invaded by the Martians by it then. It doesn't matter. I'm asking. 2020, bro. So I, listen, I feel like, listen, like, no, we no, no, about I don't want to get political. I don't want to say this. No, I know. I know. But we, you had a very good comment to me this morning. You said, um, we are our own microcosm of the world. Yes. And regardless of the storm that may rage um, outside of our doors, we have a responsibility to the people we love and lead to hold it down. 
And, um, you know, the, no matter who gets in elected and what happens and the contention, um, it's just an opportunity to be a brighter light. You know, like I just went to Chick-fil-A and they still said my pleasure is pretty nice, you know, and it's a, just a brighter, it's a, it's a way to have a brighter light right now, which is awesome. I think. Yeah. And my, my comment to you was, look, you know, no, no one's coming, you know, no politics, no one's coming to save you. Right. Mm -mm. Right. I mean, so you have to be accountable for the life that you're in. No one's going to change anything in your life. And I said, I want to be kind of a sovereign. I'm going to, my thoughts are going to be kind of sovereign in that. I'm not going to let be influenced by, Oh, woe is me, this person, or Oh, woe is me, that person's in and, and start to maybe get defensive about my, my life. I was just saying, you know what? We're just going to go. We're going to burn the boats like we always have and, and, and let life and let life happen where it is. What's supposed to happen will happen. Life happens for you, not against you, you know, as Tony, yep, as Tony says, you. right? Yep. And so that's, that's kind of what I adopted this morning as it's just been as, as it well, literally up till four in the morning last night um, and, and tired. But I've been going on fumes of, of being a little bit energized with, hey, you know, sometimes it's the, it's the sand in the clam. That makes the pearl right and this has kind of been something that's you know aggravate ag yeah maybe that's a weird analogy <laughs> i just thought i just i i went off in a weird place on my own i'm sorry i won't let's not touch that one but yeah the sand and the clam makes the pearl yes um so anyway it's, i think yeah, it's i think irritant. it's just interesting that that, that uh that oh i believe in that so much did you ever listen to the bonnie uh the sage robbins uh podcast yet i, I did i did it was very touching you were yeah. very uh, you got very vulnerable craig I appreciate that. But it is those, it is the things that have happened to me. Like literally I talk about things now that have happened and I'm like, God is so good. Thank you, God, for doing that for me. God just, I, and I don't want to get, you know, cause whatever your idea of God, universe, karma, whatever you call it for you personally, it's, it's amazing when you start looking at life as these forces and, and a sense of wonderment. I wonder what this could be versus such certainty. Like this sucks. My candidate didn't get in. You know, it's and funny, Craig. So you, you bring this up. I was listening to Naval, a Naval thing. Uh, you know, as we always talk about Naval, and he was saying, you know, he's like he was saying he feels sorry for the rich and entitled people that are born into kind of silver spoons because people look back and they reflect. They reflect gloriously and joyfully and have good they feelings do. about the struggles they went yeah, through and yes. the shit they burnt themselves out of. Yeah. That is their book of happiness at the end it's of the day. Me too. Me too. It's not like it's just not that. Yeah, I got a Ferrari because I was given it. It's it's I went through this time and I kept moving or I went through this. And I kept doing it, whatever yeah. it is. And so it's funny that your book of happiness, when you're all done with this life, is the shit that you had Isn't to that fucking so eat. Funny? It's so funny. I was literally emailing someone the other day, like we were looking at some numbers like, oh, Dr. So-and-so who resigned, you know, that's why those numbers are different. And I literally wrote in the email, I said it like, God is so good. And like, mm -hmm. like the, there's a reply internally of like, LOL, like you're so funny. I'm like, oh my God, I didn't even realize that. I wasn't, I wasn't saying it like in a bad way, like screw that person. It was like, thank you, God, for removing a toxic person out of my life that mm -hmm. I didn't remove. They, re they removed themselves like even better. I you think that's where that you and I you both agree is that, is that when you're in the bad, you, you, you get temporarily well as me. And I always, we remind each other that like, yeah, you all that. you need is enough distance on this problem for it to become the silver lining. That's all yes. you need is just a yes. little more time because it always does. You know, even I'm going through something right now with my wife and family that, you know, one day is going to be a really good silver lining and it's traumatic yeah. to my family right now, right? Yeah. Especially my wife. And, but one day there's going to be an amazing silver lining. I oh, yes. know it. Oh, a hundred percent, man. A hundred percent. All that. And remember on the podcast, like, you know, rewind like two years ago and I was like, oh, Chris going through something. And like, it was all about, like, I kept saying like, oh, I'm going through something with, with this employee. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if I said it or not, but you know, I would say that to you. And mm -hmm. I, I, maybe I said it in the podcast or not. I literally, I mean, I look back on that person, that time of my life and I'm, I'm, I want to give myself some grace because it was exactly what I needed to go through to get to where mm -hmm. I am but I kind of want to slap that guy mm -hmm. and, uh, and like violently slap him. And just like, shut the F up. Like, man, right. I'm like, don't, what are you doing this? I was talking about with Bonnie with Sage. Um, I was like inappropriate suffering and, and sh you know, it was being it, a little bitch, weren't you? Yeah. Well, it was worse. It was worse. And I don't know if I ever told you this, but I was like taking my daughter on a daddy daughter date night. Mm -mm. And I got a text from the attorney. It was like a bad employee situation. It's so stupid. It was literally like, it was like flies on my ankle. It was mm -hmm. nothing. It was nothing. It was you nothing. You got hijacked. You got emotionally I, I, hijacked. No, I allowed myself to get hijacked. I yeah, hijacked yeah, myself. Yeah. I bullshitted myself. So anyway, Sage, my daughter, um, 
uh, looks at me and says, daddy, what, what's wrong? And I have a very transparent energy. Like Pete, you always say, you're at a three right now. You're seven right now, whatever you always tease me. Mm-hmm. But anyway, she looks at me, she's like, what's up? And I'm like, I, I was pissed because the lawyer wanted to talk to me. And I said, not now. I can't talk now. Mm-hmm. And my daughter, who's nine at the time, looks at me. She's like, this is so, you know, you know, I'll make up a name. This is Diane, isn't it? I'm like, no, no. She's like, it is. She's ruining our life. And she starts <laughs> crying. I'm like, oh, f-. in my head, I'm like, fuck. I brought this all the way into my daughter. Yeah, it's permeated to a nine-year-old. How did I allow that to happen? And I forgive Diane, totally cool with Diane. And I actually don't wish her well, all good. I have no spite towards the people that in my life that have caused me aggravation. Zero Pete. I'm not bullshitting, but I also forgive my prior self, but that will never happen again. Ever. And you you gave yourself grace, but you didn't lose the fucking lesson, dude. You meant you said (laughs) that that happened and it's never going to happen again. again. Right. And, and, and that was the hard pain. It took your daughter speaking up, but like, that's sometimes I think in life you have to get the lesson, but you better sure remember that lesson. But that lesson gets turned up until you hear it. I talked about that with Uh with Sage. So like either learn it now or like, okay, oh, you didn't learn it. You, yeah. You're still, uh, still how about I give this you up. this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or yeah, you, you know, you're not, you're not appreciating your wife. You're not appreciating your husband. You're not, okay. How about now? Mm-hmm. Oh shit. Now I do. Oh yeah. yes. Thank you. know. All right, Craig. Well, that was interesting. We went, we went, we started at this podcast as hygiene too many dollar practice. And now look where we are. We have, we have literally just I, gone. I, I hijacked you. I no, I, it's beautiful because I honestly, I hope people, in this, I think this was a great portion of the podcast. I hope people didn't, uh, if, you, if you tuned out because you didn't want to hear the, the $2 million hygiene hack, then you missed this. Just yeah, kidding. it's true. And in the spirit of what's going on right now, it's important to, it is important. Um, to, to hear that last part. Well, everyone, um, yeah, that's all we got for today. Craig, I'm going to hit I got one, one quick promo. Uh, one quick promo. Oh, promo. One promo, yeah. Promo. So Pete and I, uh, Pete, I should say, has spent an inordinate amount of time um, editing and curating the most masterful online mm-hmm. course, which I'm really proud about. I know mm-hmm. you've worked your tail off on it. I flew up to uh, to Atlanta. We did two days or three days of shooting. But we but, like rented a studio. Like we did. Oh, it I know it's badass. Right? I know. Right. We put. We had the. You know. Um, we did. It was cool. We, it was cool. And, and what was remarkable? What I learned most from that, Craig, is that <laughs> how is my torso? I knew you were going there, brother. <laughs> I knew. I I could see the twinkle <laughs> of your eye. What was remarkable? I'm like this motherfucker is going to tease me. <laughs> So, so, so Craig is obviously so, a little bit bigger, y'all, than me. Uh, you know, I'm uh, taller. I'm not sta- bigger. Standing, yes, big, taller. We always stands, and he's like, "What's it like being, old, you know, a couple of inches shorter than me?" I'm like, "Dude, I'm, like, I'm not short." Anyway, so we sit down. So he's always kind of like peacocking <laughs> over me a little bit. So he sits no, down, I'm not. I'm and he says, and he says, yourself. "Hey, are these chairs the same height?" Because Pete were- has a very, very significantly large torso, and I think I have a, a smaller torso. So the the mixture of the two you'll see on the online video. Oh, is, so check this out. So Bo, uh, Pete's photographer, uh, videographer rather, is seven foot one, right? Mm-hmm. Seven foot one. Mm-hmm. I have them sit side to side. And Pete is actually <laughs> taller than <laughs> Bo, who's the size of Wilt freaking Chamberlain. Your torso is bigger than his. So I don't, if anything, yeah. it's just So Craig's nickname torso. is now the micro torso, if anyone wants to. And Pete uh, is, is uh, our micro is. legs. Pete the actually micro- is six foot two with a 26 inch seam. He's the same as my son, Gavin. <laughs> anyway, with that, guys, we love you. Thanks that for listening. It. Drop Wait, us you, a like didn't even really, We didn't even really promote it. So No, Craig, but it's, all, it's awesome. It's Talk not done about yet. It. it really is. I'm going through the editing, y'all. And sometimes when you go through something like that, you want to beat yourself "Ah, is this good is this good and then i craig as i've revisited it editing it to make sure that it's bulletproof worthy of us right because we we, you know because we got a reputation at stake i don't want to just put something out there for the hell of it i wanted to really go through it but going through it again like holy shit that that right there that little segment was going to be worth the price worth the price of the course it will be changing to the per life changing to the person that hears it or does it or implements it that one little thing and it may be that one person but going through it, and Chris Tuff, who's our director of our Bulletproof Mastermind, is in it, and he's the he's the he's um, rock star. He's the author of uh, New York Times bestseller, The Millennial, Millennial Whisperer, Whisper, and has a yeah. has a real thing. He owns part of a works, marketing works company, Nike. Yeah, but so he's in, he's in very in touch with large organizations. He, like I said, he's in a marketing. He owns part of a marketing company that has hundreds of employees, and so he's really good at the millennial culture. So he speaks a lot about culture. And just, you know, anyway, the point is, it's a really good course. I'm really proud of it, bud. And I know you and I are, you know, are really kind of been speaking about it recently because it's about to go to market. Um, 
or be posted or whatever you say, but it's really cool. And I'm, I'm proud of it. And I'm proud I've done it with you, Pud. I appreciate that, Pud. Likewise, I called you Pud, for, by the way, just then. Would you call me Pud? I don't know. I said, I'm proud to do it with you, Pud. Oh, it's partner and Bud. I love that. Pud. You can't call me Pud. <laughs> this is my Pud. <laughs> my Pud. Peter. Here's my Pud, Greg. Yeah, Pud <laughs> sounds off. I want to be your Pud. I think I'm delirious. Anyway, can we, no close this, can we close this mouth phone now? All right, close it out. All right. Nice to see you, Pete. We Thanks love for y'all. listening. We love y'all. Hey, if you, if you can, keep writing those reviews. You guys oh, we lo- Yeah, we do appreciate that. You guys that. have crushed. When I got butthurt by that so, 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 or show, 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 they gave us a horrible review. Our bulletproof. Squad By the way, that horrible review. The horrible review is one so, one star. It said ten minute podcast suck. It I wasn't know, like I these know. guys just yammer no, on no, no. and they give no value. My point is, is that people came out in droves to d- defend us, and it's just so cool to see it because that really is our oxygen. As everyone, we've always said that, and it wasn't yeah. a ploy to get more reviews. We love seeing the impact that we've had because we've all had it. You know, we've all been given impact by people. So we love y'all. Everyone have a great rest of your day, and over and out. See you guys. Thanks, Pete.